like to welcome our viewers joining the session today titled is education pivotal for the future of online advertising i'd also like to make a special welcome to our panelists rachel robin and yonel rachel barbara mack is a director at media smart uk and media smart is the education non-profit organization from the uk advertising industry with a mission to ensure that young people can confidently navigate the media they consume including being able to identify interpret and critically evaluate all forms of advertising. Rachel also co-founded her own youth marketing agency, running award-winning social impact campaigns for the likes of Apple, EA Sports and MTV. Rachel is also the programs director at ASBOF, which supports trust in advertising by funding self-regulation in the UK through the Advertising Standards Authority. We also have Robin DeValters, who's a communication and commercial manager at FEDMA. He's also a certified information privacy professional. And before FEDMA, Robin managed the communication efforts at the European Interactive Digital Advertising Alliance, the EDAA. We also have Dr. Yonel Naftanayla, who's a pro program director, director at the EDAA. He brings a, with a wealth of industry knowledge and experience. He has a PhD in economic studies. Uh, Yonel also worked at uh, IAB Europe and also managed a company that developed and maintained ad servers and uh, ad exchanges. And my name is Conrad Sheck and I'm the Director of Policy Research at the Advertising Association and I'm moderating the session today. I wanted to start off by talking about the increasingly complex media landscape we live in. People are spending more time online by their individual devices than ever before. We consume more media than ever before. And the global pandemic has accelerated those digital trends. Now, of course, digital advertising has been a beneficiary of this growth of the internet. It's been a boon to advertising and marketing departments as the technology has allowed them to speak directly to customers through personalization. But increasing volumes of personalized ads has led to consumers complaining about bombardment and the sense that creepy ads are following them around the web. And as a result, we've seen online advertising attracting an unprecedented amount of regulatory scrutiny, which has also been evidenced by the introduction of draft legislation like the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. The question is, have we reached a tipping point? So let me start with Yonel and, and Robin. Both of you represent two prominent industry organizations who work with close contact with hundreds of industry players in the market. How do you think industry is responding to this regulatory challenge and to what extent will this impact business models? You know? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Um, let me begin by saying a few words about EDAs. I'm not sure if everyone uh, watching this panel knows what we do. So just very, very quickly, EDA was founded in 2012 uh, by a European industry coalition representing advertisers, the advertising agency sector, the interactive and direct marketing sector, the advertising technology sector, and the media sector. So the EDA is governed by EU level organizations, uh, which make up the value chain of data driven advertising within Europe, uh, in, including UK. Um, and we basically deploy two main tools in the European markets uh, for the benefit of consumers and businesses alike, uh, namely the Ad Choices icon, uh, which is the little blue triangle that shows up on virtually every online ad, and the consumer choice platform uh, at onlinechoices.eu that allows people to learn more about digital advertising and to make choices about interest-based advertising. So in a nutshell, this is what EDA does and how we sort of um, relate to the question uh, that you have just uh, have just asked. So just to go back to the question, um, what we see um, from um, dialogues with, with stakeholders um, of, of EDA, there is of course growing concern about overregulation, or rather about regulation that may have unintended consequences. Um, there are parts of the ecosystem, uh, or rather practices uh, within the ecosystem, which are notoriously difficult to regulate correctly. Um, and I include privacy here. And getting it wrong can lead to either ineffective laws, so laws which are difficult, or more bluntly put, uh, simply unenforceable, or can create situations where market competition is hindered, or can simply create confusion for users and unnecessary 
uh, compliance costs and burdens for businesses. So this is this is one sort of one side of the of the question that you have asked, and the other one is really about the the, the business model. So what changes, right, um, with this increased uh, regulatory pressure and from recent experience, really, um, including the, the implementation of the GDPR, uh, I can say that to some extent, any change brings opportunity. So for instance, when we talk about uh, uh, GDPR, we, one can, can easily see that it has brought up a new whole new category of services to the market. And I'm just, you know, uh, just to give the example of the so-called CMPs, consent management platforms, that are being used by website owners to collect and distribute users' consent, consent signals throughout the supply chain. Um, but we're also seeing like uh, with this sort of, again, uh, regulatory pressure and legislative changes, a few other phenomena, which is big tech companies thinking about how to restructure their te technology uh, or their technologies um, better comply with laws, but that inherently puts them in advantage of a smaller competitors, simply because they have easier access to the necessary resources. And I'm, I'm thinking finance, financial resources and, and, and um, sort of manpower. Um, then we can also see a number of mergers and acquisitions. Um, part of those are actually seem to be related to unsustainable more difficult to be sustained really compliance costs, thus driving consolidation within the industry. And thirdly, we, one can sort of uh, see with the, with the naked eye, the industry scrambling to find solutions, including technical solutions. Um, uh, let's not forget that the ecosystem works more or less in the same way. Um, for the last 20 years. So including technical solutions, which are not easy to be found to everything that's either uh, law or is about to become, to become law. So yes, I would say it's a period of great change uh, and uncertainty for the industry. Um, but at the same time, I think we should look at it from a, from a positive perspective. Um, as we collectively, uh, after all, we work for, um, for uh, industry associations, industry trade bodies. So we collectively have the opportunity to address some of the key issues that seem to hinder progress and innovation for the industry. So I'm, I'm torn. <laughs> it's, a, it's a period of great uh, challenge, but also um, it's a period of great opportunity. I know this is a tourism in a way, but I really feel that this is the, the describing very, very well the, the period we're going through right now. And Robin? Thank you, Conrad. Um, so really also just in a nutshell, nutshell about FEDMA. So FEDMA is the Federation of European Data and Marketing. Um, we promote and protect the European data-driven marketing industry by creating greater acceptance, usage, and confidence in data and marketing by both consumers and business communities. And our main objective is really to develop ethical standards for the industry to ensure greater consumer trust. And this is really how I would uh, respond to the question about how, to how the industry is responding to the regulatory challenge is by creating uh, standards, codes of conduct, which is really a main focus of FEDMA to bridge the, to help both companies be GD GDPR compliant and also uh, in turn benefit consumers because it's all about striking this balance between uh, companies and their need to have a functional uh, business model and respecting the privacy of, of consumers. And there's no better way of doing that than by raising awareness and, and consumer education. Thanks, Robin. Let me go to the next question. Um, again, going back to you, uh, Yonel, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the importance of the role of the EDA in addressing some of the concerns of consumers and, and policy makers. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question and thank you for raising it. Um, I actually think the root of the question itself sits first and foremost with the people, with the consumers. Um, I, I, I think regulatory attention is usually a direct consequence of consumer perceived issues. So we must begin with the consumers. We must look at consumers first. 
And from, from that point of view, um, EDA is, 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 is aiming through its mission to make a difference on uh, three fundamental dimensions, which are all consumer facing when it comes to digital advertising. Um, one is education, hence the very good work uh, we have been doing in the UK uh, with the great support of MediaSmart. Um, then transparency, um, trying to explain and to, um, yeah, uh, allow people to see what's going on behind the scenes. And thirdly, choice and control, which is like the third pillar of what we're, 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 we're building, uh, because once you um, understand what's going on, once you, once you have this level of transparency, people actually should be able to act upon, upon it, uh, whether they like it or not. Uh, in the sense of what they are seeing, uh, they should be, they should be uh, able to act if they don't like something uh, or to ask for more of something uh, that they like. So from a consumer perspective, these are all like complementary dimensions and we can think of consumer trust. I would like to sort of bring the, the focus back to the, to, to, to the trust issue, which was, which was uh, previously mentioned by, by, by Robin as well. So I think we can uh, look at consumer trust as a three-legged stool, um, which is really, uh, the, the way I frame it is this. So you need transparency uh, to disclose openly what's going on. But transparency without some sort of education uh, that would support it is, is not enough to put it mildly because people need to actually be able to understand what's being disclosed, to process that information and to make decisions based on that information. And for that, you need consumer education. So that's sort of the second pillar. And the third pillar is choice and control to be actually able to act on the decisions, to implement those decisions, so to have tools um, put at people's disposal by, by, the, uh, by the industry uh, in order to enable them. Uh, so therefore, I, I believe that digital advertising self-regulation and EDA is all about about digital advertising self-regulation along the three dimensions is really essential for like a healthy ecosystem and for a healthy relationship between brands and websites, uh, advertising supply chain uh, partners and the users we all, we all serve. So how, just to go back to the, and to summarize how important is it? I think it's essential, if not the organization itself, but at least the mission and the core objectives and the vision that we stand behind, I think it's key. I think it, it, it's actually, it cannot be done without those uh, three uh, pillars. Um, I mean, addressing the concerns of consumers and as a consequence of policymakers. Great, thanks, Yonol. You mentioned media smarts and education. I think this is a perfect point to bring in Rachel. Rachel, you lead an educational program, Media Smart UK, to raise digital and advertising literacy. And you've been involved in developing many teaching resources for young people. What effect do you think this has had on people's perceptions of advertising? Thanks, Conrad. Well, it's an interesting question because when I came in to relaunch Media Smart back in 2014, the fact that it was from the ad industry wasn't front and centre of the messaging and in the comms to educators and parents. And what we found when talking to our target audience, well, they thought it was a great thing that the industry was doing it and we were the best people to deliver it, being the experts in advertising. And so we are now very open and proud that it's an ad industry initiative and we, that gets a fantastic response from teachers and guardians working with young people. Um, and then in terms of parliamentarians' perceptions of the programme, we really do get cross-party support. Everyone I ever talk to about Media Smart in Westminster or Holyrood, they think it's a positive thing and they all acknowledge the growing importance of ensuring young people are media and digitally literate. So I would say Media Smart is supporting the ambition to build public trust in advertising and improving positive perceptions of the industry. Now it isn't a silver bullet, but it is one of the many things that advertising is doing to be responsible. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, just ask a slightly different question. I don't know if you've ever heard of a phenomenon called uh, the privacy paradox, which consumers state that privacy is important to them, but often their online behaviors do not mirror those concerns. 
Do you think this is also true for young people you work with? And if so, what extent do you think that media and digital literacy education can support them in this area? Well, I actually hadn't heard the phrase before, but I do think it is true of many young people, particularly the younger kids. Um, one example of that that comes up a lot is that they don't often appreciate that apps and platforms that they're using are free because they have an advertising model. So with this example, we talk to them about the value exchange, you get something because you give something in return. And with that quite simple critical literacy skill, you find the penny starts to drop with young people. It makes them slow down, read the small print and start to question and reflect on why they're being asked certain things when they sign up for services and apps. And it teaches them that they can take control of their own privacy, it belongs to them. Um, in the same way that our, that's our new resource with the EDAA educates them that they can manage their online advertising experience through the app choices icon. They can decide their preferences and take control of what adverts they do and don't see. Great, thanks Rachel. I'm going to take the, uh, the discussion in a slightly different uh, direction and, and perhaps just focusing on a little bit more of the, perhaps the negative perception around online advertising. I'm aware and I'm sure you're also aware that the online um, advertising industry is also having to contend with increasingly skeptical consumers. So there's some research recently published by the EDA um, which gauges consumer attitudes. And according to this research, they found that despite positive attitudes towards the EDA program, uh, ad blocker usage remains uh, relatively high. My understanding is that it's 30% of respondents employing it frequently. So this is clearly not good for ad funded business models. I've got to ask two uh, questions, one to you know, and one to Robin. So with you know first, why do you think ad blocking usage remains stubbornly frequent? And do you think the EDAA can play a role in addressing consumer skepticism? And then Robin, how, do you, how well do you think consumers understand the importance of online ads as a source of revenue? And do you think skeptical consumers can be won over? So let me let me start with uh, with the question that you have addressed to me, Conrad. The firstly, I think it's a it's a very interesting question, very very relevant, and certainly at the forefront of many streams of work uh, that try to address consumer concerns in digital advertising. Um, in terms of the causes themselves, I've seen like multiple studies that attempt to understand the, the, uh, the roots of the issue. Um, in short, uh, privacy is definitely one of those causes, but probably not the most important. Um, I think the ad blocking phenomenon is more related to factors like uh, overall experience uh, when visiting websites, um, things like too many ads, um, ads covering content, ads which are irrelevant, uh, ads which may be offending for certain people, you name it, right? So there's all kinds of little things that would add up and that would actually uh, uh, prompt somebody to install such of a tool, which is really like a very blunt tool to solve um, like narrow issues that somebody may have. So when it comes to the EDA and how it could potentially address some of those issues, um, one could actually make the argument that we're contributing to some extent to solving it via the tools that we, we deploy uh, already and via the work we are doing. And I include here the educational work, which is, which is currently being done uh, with, with, with Media Smart in the UK, right? So that's, that's one thing. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to claim that you know, what we're doing is some sort of a miracle cure uh, for ad blocking. But at the same time, the triple is of the self-regulatory program run by the EDA, which is which are again, consumer education, transparency, choice and control, they can be applied here as well. Um, it's all about people, uh, giving people the right choices. And I'm gonna stop here, but with a rather rhetorical question, what if people uh, could easily signal to the ecosystem that an ad, is not relevant, or that it covers the, the content of a website, or that they have already bought, this is the big one, right? 
uh, already bought the product which is being advertised. Wouldn't that make things a little bit easier and maybe move the needle on that, on the ad blocking issue a little bit? So yeah, uh, the answer is open, but uh, this, is, uh, this is what I think on a very high level. So yeah, to, to pick up on that and also to, to, to answer to your, your previous question, Conrad, I think um, in terms of, I mean, it's clear research has shown in the EDA research, but also in, 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 uh, in research that uh, the FEDMA and GDMA, the Global Data and Marketing Alliance has, has, has conducted in the past few years, that the more you educate consumers, the happier they are to share data. And I think that that goes not only with digital advertising, but just with uh, well, with anything really about sharing data. If there's transparency, if they know what the data is for, and that they, they trust that there's not, it's not going to be misused, people are usually fine in, in, in sharing data. So that's really kind of like the holistic um, approach. And what's important to note is that a lot of consumers kind of uh, mirroring what you said about the, 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 the sandbox, uh, so privacy, sand, uh, no, the, the sandbox dilemma or I remember the exact word you, you mentioned privacy before, but paradox, pri yeah. privacy, privacy uh, paradox, um, is that a lot of people are just tired of too many layers of information. The, pri the privacy policies, for example, that are extremely lengthy, that just make people want to click either, either they're just not going to click, they're going to not download the app or not accept whatever the, the, the policy is for, or they're just going to click it on it without, without really knowing what they're doing. And this is the, the really the important thing and that the industry is really trying to, 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 to tackle is to provide clarity and real information that is useful to the consumer about why their data is being used and what, what it's being used for. And research has shown, the research I, I mentioned before about uh, GDMA, uh, is that over 40% of consumers understand that sharing data is an essential part of a smooth uh, system of a smooth way of functioning. They know that if they want to buy something online, they're gonna to have to give their address, they're gonna to have to give in their credit card number. Of course, that's very sensitive information and so on, but it's obvious. So the point is not about sharing data, it's about sharing data in a, in a, in a clever way and in a transparent way. Um, and that's really why I think that skeptical, skeptical consumers, sorry, can be won over by providing them with clearer information. And this goes through every industry actor. Uh, and this is what FEDMA uh, is, is really trying to do uh, in terms of uh, data and marketing is to provide clearer guidelines, ethical standards, as I mentioned before, to all companies to respect. And of course, the regulatory framework is going to help a lot. We also, we already have the GDPR, but there's, as you mentioned, the DSA, the DMA, there's the privacy, uh, there's, I mean, then that's just for Europe. Then you have CCPA in, the, in California. I mean, you have, they're popping up a bit everywhere. But in the end, companies, especially multinationals that are cross-country, they need to step up their game in providing rules that are, that are ethical, that are transparent, that value privacy, that are, um, yeah, that are really meant for the, the consumer in a, in a friendly way. And in the end, I think it's, 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 a, it's the... Um, it's clear that a company wants a lasting relationship with their consumers, with their customers. Um, that's really what they want. They're, they're, it's, not, it's not good for anyone if they lose their customers. So what's important is to continue a lasting relationship with these existing customers while respecting the decision of those that maybe just, you know, they're not interested in that product. Great, great point there. So just following on the theme of awareness building, I want to turn back to Rachel again. Um, you've been running media smart campaigns in the UK for a number of years now. What are the key learnings from this experience? And do you think policymakers are sufficiently engaged in the concept of advertising literacy? Two big questions there, Conrad. Um, a couple of key learnings. You have to focus on the subjects that matter to educators and young people, not just the topics that the ad industry wants to focus on or talk about. And it's finding that sweet spot because teachers are time poor and the national curriculum, you know, I'm sure in every country is absolutely packed. 
Um, we, all, we are starting to do a lot more research with young people about what help they need in this area. So the programme is becoming a lot more youth led rather than us deciding, you know, what they need to hear from us. Um, make the campaigns or resources film based because they can stand alone on social media or in the cinema or on TV. And then they reach a much, much broader and larger audience than our resource and animation with the EDAA, for instance, that's reached hundreds of thousands of parents too. So that's adults that might not know about the Ad Choices icon, for instance. And so that's a win-win. This enables us to educate people outside of the classroom in different countries and increases advertising and digital literacy across the generations. You know, it isn't all about young people. Um, and then in terms of policy makers, um, we understand that the UK is meant to be publishing a national media literacy strategy. We don't know too much about it yet. Um, and parliamentarians are definitely taking an interest in media literacy to combat other forms of online harm, such as misinformation. There's absolutely tons of interest and attention at the moment and funding for what I call news literacy at the moment. Um, I think there's always more that can be done to work with the ad industry to deliver effective and better funded programmes and to potentially make it part of the school national curriculum. You know, that would be our absolute ideal. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, turning back to, you know, you mentioned your partnerships, so the EDA partnership with MediaSmart to deliver an educational resource to raise awareness of the, your online choices. Um, and how online behavioural advertising works. What do you think the impact of the resource has been so far? Yeah, great question as well. I am I'm very, very positive about uh, what's, what's going on. Uh, we've received, um, of course, the, the, once you create something like this, it's, it's sort of growing from day to day, right? Because the, the, the big advantage of such of a resource is that if the, the number of people who have seen it at least once can only go up. Um, so that's, that's amazingly good, right? So in terms of the actual numbers, that's of course unfolding, but what I can say with like great uh, pleasure and positivism is that uh, we've received great feedback from virtually everyone who has learned about the resource, uh, great feedback from the businesses we work with, um, great feedback from other stakeholders we, we engage with um, at European level, at national level. It's been really, really well received. So the uh, one of the purposes of the project we've run in the UK with MediaSmart was to evaluate how effective such a resource uh, would be uh, in terms of moving the needle with regard to consumers understanding of what's going on. And we're very, very happy uh, with the results. Uh, they're very encouraging. And I think action speaks more than, uh, more than words. Uh, basically what we're doing now is to plan the deployment in several other European markets. And we're engaging uh, as we speak with media smart counterparts in other uh, key um, EU economies to iron out the details for the rollout. Um, so yeah, very, very positive about, about the project and about its, uh, its impact. Great, and Robin, you also had a, a role in this um, during your time at the EDAA. Um, do you think this is a, um, an area that online advertising should invest more resources in? And do you think that FEDMA, the, your current organization now, has plans for a similar type of education program in the future? So, so yeah, dual, dual questions here. I mean, definitely uh, on the first, uh, I mean, the, the work that, that EDA and MediaSmart are doing is, is, is great. And there's, there's a lot, there's always room for more, uh, not just on their behalf, but in general, on behalf of the industry. I mean, EDA represents, as Yanel said, a, a, a wide area of types of organizations. And they all have their part to do in, 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 uh, in ensuring that there's a real awareness raising and education uh, in their own in their own way and form. So there's definitely always more that can be done. Uh, in terms of FEDMA, um, so we are we ha we also have uh, I, I wouldn't say similar, but we also have some sort of educational programs, but they're more at national level. So talking of the UK, sorry. There's the Institute of Data and Marketing, which is part of the UK uh, DMA, the Data and Marketing Association. And they have different programs to advance the careers of future marketers 
through, uh, well, through educational programs. Uh, so this is some sort of uh, some sort of consumer education, perhaps more specific to people who are already in this field in some some way and form. Um, but there's again, there's it's a it's a growing industry, and especially with what has happened in the past year and a half now, with people spending even more time online, there's even a greater need to address um, these these consumer needs and and this educational um, need. So I think we have the we have a, a, a an open and competitive market thanks to data access. And what we need to do now is provide more effort in uh, in raising awareness. And this goes through all the actors in the industry. FEDMA is, as I said, a, um, an association that represents the European uh, data and marketing uh, associations. And what we want to achieve is a code of conduct for all organizations in the EU, and then of course, broader, to in turn, um, companies are, are, are are just the middlemen to the consumer, basically. It's consumer education through, it's B2B to C, business to business to consumer. This is really what we're, what we're aiming for and, and how we're, we're trying to, to achieve a uh, global or at least a European awareness on, on, these, uh, on these topics. Great. I'm getting a very strong sense that everybody agrees that education is, a, uh, is critical for a healthy and beneficial ecosystem for all parties involved. And I was just wondering, I'm going to turn to each of you in, in turn. I wonder if you could just give me a very, very brief summary of what you think is needed to get widespread traction and further support for such in initiatives. So let me start with Robin. Sorry. Uh, I, no, I think I would just, I would just reiterate what, uh, what, what, I've, what has been said is really the needs to to, to go through the consumer education is the cornerstone of all work, no, regardless of the topic. I mean, here we're, we're, talk, we're talking about digital advertising and privacy and so on, but it doesn't matter what any company does if they don't, uh, if they don't include their customers, their clients, their suppliers, their consumers, uh, their customers and so on, it's, it's not gonna go anywhere. So I think it's really important that, that everybody takes it seriously um, as, as I said, FEDMA and, and then a GDMA at global level, we have we just launched uh, last week um, a, a global privacy principles, so seven privacy principles that are targeted for all organizations that deal with data and marketing, which is almost any organization really, um, to to improve their 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 view and their work towards uh, in valuing privacy for consumers. So I think I would uh, I would finish on that. Uh, you know? Yeah, I'm going to say something which can be uh, seen a little bit, uh, I don't know, uh, can be disputed, but, I, but I, I, I would actually like to state something uh, which I think is true. I think we as the industry sometimes tend to not keep our eyes on the ball. And by this, I mean that right now, the industry, because we were starting with this regulatory pressure and what happens and how do people react to it and what, you know, what changes and what does the industry do to sort of comply or to mitigate and whatnot, right? And I think people in the industry, and th that's natural and I'm going to explain why I think it's natural, but at the same time, I think people in the industry wrongly believe that this is what the ball is and it's not. The ball is, and you know, on an intellectual level, we all know it, sometimes we just forget it, but the ball is the relationship with our clients. Legal compliance is essential because without legal compliance, you cannot do business. But then what do we actually do to improve that relationship, to improve consumer trust, to improve the, the perception that people have on, on the industry itself? And I was saying, I think it's natural for the, for the businesses to sort of, you know, uh, try to, 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 to patch the uh, wound that hurts uh, at the moment. That's, that's all fine. But at the same time, I think we as um, industry associations, I think that's the exact role of industry associations to sort of keep companies aware of the long-term goals and issues in relationship with consumers. Uh, I was saying businesses are inherently focused on the yearly bottom line, that's normal. Such education efforts take years before um, the needle is, is moving in any perceptible way. 
Um, but when it is moving, it is to the benefit of virtually everyone who's involved. So uh, that requires constant attention and effort. And this is, in my view, clearly a part of our collective mission. Great. And Rachel, is there anything you, you'd like to add? Yeah, this is where I get to do a shameless plug, isn't it? I mean, my view is, you know, Media Smart, we've got 34 fantastic industry supporters, but if you are involved in the advertising industry, whether media, platform, brand, ad agency, you know, you should be supporting Media Smart and programs like Media Smart. Um, and, you know, self-regulation is a fantastic thing, and we all need to do our bit to build um, public trust in advertising. Um, so let's go for it and let's support us. <laughs> Great, absolutely. So I want to um, end on this final question that's directed at you and all. Um, you, of course, are leading the EDA program, the Online Choices program, that provides um, aims to provide end users with greater transparency and options to tailor their online experience. Why do you think it's important that industry joins programs like this? Uh, I, I, I think I'm going to approach this by sort of trying, well, somewhat summarizing some of my earlier points. Like I was, I, I keep on saying self-regulation is about doing the right thing as industry towards consumers. So um, self-regulation is not about legal compliance in itself. It's really about being able to like on top of the letter of the law to approach the different issues on the table in a responsible manner. So I also think it's about delivering a sustainable future for the industry by adapting the rules to the market realities and to the consumer expectations, which by the way are changing very, very rapidly. Um, and this is possible through self-regulation in a, in a much better way, I would say, than any regulation can possibly do. Okay. This flexibility, this setting of the rules um, above the letter of the law, this is something that people who are really close to the industry acting in good faith can and should be, uh, should be, should be doing. So the EDA mission, um, consumer education, transparency, choice and control, I keep saying this, but this is what we stand for, uh, continues to be as relevant as ever. And anyone in the digital advertising um, field, any responsible uh, digital advertising player who, who, who um, works with data fundamentally um, and that wish to do good uh, by the consumer uh, on these three dimensions uh, are either in the program or should be in the program. Uh, that's my view about this. Great, thank you. So on that note, I, I must, I'm afraid, draw this fascinating discussion to a close. Um, before I, I do this, I just wanted to summarize a, a few key points. You know, you mentioned the importance of your educational partnership with EDA and, and Media Smart, um, the important role it has in educating consumers about how online advertising works and the value that it delivers. Rachel, you mentioned that Media Smart is supporting the ambition to build public uh, trust in advertising. It's not a silver bullet, but it's one of the many things that advertising is doing. And also you mentioned the importance of focusing on the subject that subject matters, um, which are important to educators and to young people. And Robin, you mentioned about the need to find a balance uh, for privacy, which is really important for consumers and also for industry to deliver value as well. So just to uh, sum up and, and finish here, I think it seems quite clear that education does have a key role to play in the future of online advertising. And I think there ought to be a lot more conversations with industry, education providers and policymakers to figure out a way to do this effectively. So that finally, I'd like to thank my panelists, Yonel, Rachel and Robin, and to our, and to our viewers. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.